This is the story of the one. As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24-7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage, Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Ah, welcome back to Heard Tell Show. Been a while since we've had him. He's had some life stuff going on. Thrilled to have him back. Our buddy, John McCumber, cybersecurity expert, semi-retired down at Del Voca Vista or whatever. How you say it now? How's yeah, the Del Seinfeld Boca joke? Vista, the old Seinfeld joke. Yeah, we, uh, <laughs> we made the move. So just yeah. embraced retirement. He's enjoying Florida, but uh, he's got some work to do for us today, buddy. Appreciate your time. Um, I want to start here, though, because I want to do some big picture stuff, and then we'll talk about the cybersecurity stuff, because a lot of people have been freaking out about that, and we want to kind of turn the noise down on that. But I, I want to get your perspective as somebody who's been there, done that. You are a certified Cold Warrior. Um, you did your military service. Obviously, you grew up during the Cold War, and then your military service was the post-Vietnam era, we call it now, right after Vietnam, into the 80s and the 90s. You were there for the military rebuild of the U.S. military. How's this been landing with you? Because you're of that generation where y'all just kind of grew up assuming at some point we were going to deal with Russia and it was going to come to blows. Some of that probably died off as time went on, but now here it is and we're dealing with them. How's the events of the last week or so in Ukraine kind of landed with you? Well, this is, of course, not surprising in many ways, but it's also surprising. In fact, when you mentioned dealing with Russia, uh, that Cold War experience for me wasn't Russia. It was the Soviet Union. That was the big picture back then. So you had uh, a large landmass that was controlled from Moscow. And that landmass consisted of people that spoke 127 different languages, the people from different cultures. So when people thought of Russia, and I know, you know, from my youth and then, you know, my service in the military, uh, what we were thinking of was this, the bear, you know, the big giant uh, Russian uh, conglomerate, which was the Soviet Union. Uh, and then that just kind of fell apart. And, 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 and it's not surprising to see that. I mean, it's actually what's surprising how long the, the Russians were able to keep that Soviet Union together uh, in the post-World War II environment, simply because they were trying to translate. You know, every government edict had to be translated into dozens and dozens of languages, had to try to control different cultures. And so when we thought of Russia, it was this Russia in, 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 a, in a very big uh, picture. And it talked about Russia. But again, what, what, what the reality was, is we were looking at the Soviet Union and seeing uh, a, and a lot of the perception is that this is a homogeneous group of people uh, that they all sat around, hated on the United States. They did it you know, every day and that they were a powerful and massive entity. Uh, Russia today is a very, very different place and a very different country. Talking to John McCumber, I, I, it's interesting you bring that up because part of what we're seeing now is 
kind of a realignment of the old Soviet. They called them the satellite states, but really yep. they were just occupied territories. Yep. Obviously, Ukraine was one of the ones and we're dealing with that directly. But look at the pe- the powers in Europe that have really stepped up now. Poland, um, Finland has a lot of history going back to World War II where they stood the Soviets up out in the woods in the middle of nowhere. Um, the, the Balkan states are involved. Uh, Estonia, Lithuania, which have just been superstars of the open markets and freedom of the last 10, 15 years. They're worried about it. When you're talking about that old Soviet system, it's a very stark contrast how those countries are doing now compared to how they're doing then. I got to think somebody like Vladimir Putin, who wants the old Soviet empire even more than the old Soviet Union, that's just got to eat at him and his whole worldview, doesn't it? It, it has changed, and I don't know if Putin has changed. I, I can't speak for what he's thinking. Uh, I'm, I'm baffled while, why he uh, would take on this, uh, uh, this military action. But at the same time, it's a different world out there. Like you say, uh, once these men and women were, were freed from that Soviet satellite system, uh, all the natural genius, creativity, and skills of these people uh, blossomed. And you saw what happened. Uh, Estonia, I, I had the privilege of traveling through the Czech Republic uh, only a couple of years ago and getting a chance to see there are still remnants of, of the old Soviet system everywhere you look, except for the vibrancy, the market, and the, and the focus on this new new era that was coming into being ushered in a lot of it by uh, by information technology and the ability for them to have a worldwide audience. And so you've really seen a significant change and, you know, he's trying to get the band back together. It's, uh, it's going to be hard to get that genie back in that bottle. And you mentioned the, the, um, the cyber part of this, the intelligence part of this, the technology this is a technology story because everything we we know the tactics and the ground war and the military side. I don't think anybody expected Ukraine to win the propaganda war from day one and maintain that win. I don't think people uh, expected the information flow to be as good as it's been. Are are you surprised by that, or did you expect it that this really was going to be an information war on top of the shooting war, and the information war has been vivid? And it's been very apparent who's winning it and who's not. Well, let's talk about that. I know that's what we wanted to talk about today. And I get some really interesting observations on that. Please. Uh, one of the, the information warfare, some of the information warfare principles are centered around winning that uh, information war. And around that, again, you, know, you talk about uh, going into a, a military uh you know, or a, a kinetic environment where you're actually going in, sending in the tanks, sending in the troops. One of the principles uh, for most information warfare is you shut down that enemy's op- ability to be able to conduct information operations, propaganda. And again, I, it's not a value judgment. When I say propaganda, good, bad, or indifferent, whether it's it's true factual information you're getting out to the world or you're curating that information some way. So what you've seen here is not what I think is really telling about this environment, what's happened in Ukraine is what's not happening. Uh, you know, you know, with, uh, you know, again, you and I both have an Air Force background and, you know, from an Air Force perspective for air, airborne superiority, that's one of the first things we do in a kinetic engagement. First thing we do is send in the weasels and they suppress everything. They suppress anti-aircraft, they suppress command and control, they suppress communications. Uh, so an information warfare principle that's carried over from, I mean, goes back centuries uh, but, you know, if you look at one of these principles is to shut down that environment, that did not happen. So when you look at a country like Russia, you hear about their uh, you know, daunting information warfare uh, and management propaganda capabilities. What's not happening uh, is the fact that, again, whether they thought they were just going to walk in and, and just take over uh, in Ukraine, whether they didn't want to destroy or impact assets they thought they'd need to uh, be able to reconstitute for their own uses, I don't know. Uh, but I do know what's interesting is what's not happening. Is the Ukrainians better than we thought, or is the Russians worse than we thought, or is it a combination of the two? <laughs> you know, and from all I can tell, it's a combination of the two. Uh, you know, like I say, why Putin and the forces did not go in and suppress, uh, you know, Again, let's just use this term uh, globally. We'll just say the, the internet, uh, their ability to communicate, 
uh, their ability to get out and get information out to the, the world. Uh, and again, what surprises me is what's not happened. Those are principles of information warfare that are used on a, on a recurring basis. It's everybody's playbook, and it, it's just not happening here. What you're seeing, uh, to quote a good friend of mine, Jason Healy, says what you're not seeing is information warfare, you're seeing a brawl. Yeah, talking to John McCumber, cybersecurity expert, former military officer on top of that, old Cold War guy, explaining the new Cold War to us that's pretty hot in Ukraine right now. John, let me ask it to you this way. We have been told for years and years and years by uh, folks, cybersecurity experts, your brethren in that field, that the next major shooting war we were going to see was going to be uh, hand in hand and probably preemptive by massive cyber warfare. There would be infrastructure attacks. There would be massive grid attacks. You just mentioned it. We didn't see any of that. Um, is this a unique thing or was that kind of overblown? How do you read that? Because we sure didn't see any of it here. We sure didn't. And again, that's what surprises me. And it has been the biggest uh, surprise going into this, uh, this scenario with Ukraine is that it didn't happen. Uh, one of the challenges that Russia brings out, and of course we have not a dissimilar challenge. Let me talk about what that is. The, the, the Russians have a groups of, for lack of a better term, uh, let's say the word hackers. We have uh, people that, that operate in what we would call the information sphere in a way that they are combatants. And again, I don't like to overstate the uh, martial terminology here because IT is certainly not the battlefield and people are not dying from bullets and bombs. But it's important to understand that the Russians, you know, aside from their own information warfare capabilities, have a tacit uh, management of uh, a rather wide variety of uh, disparate groups of, of disaffected people that are involved and that they, you know, tacitly uh, approve of their actions, in, uh, including certain ransomware groups that have been operating over the last five years. So you see the Russians will allow this to happen. And they'll, uh, you know, I, I don't know how much control and, and I'm not in that world anymore. So I can't, uh, can't even share with you some special intelligence that I have because I don't. Uh, but it, it uh, jury's out on just about how much control they have over these groups where they can maintain plausible deniability. They have the ability to sit there and let these people wreak havoc uh, in the infrastructure and with communications, all the while claiming that, well, these are these are outside forces. These are not these are not government sponsored, paid or managed assets. We have something similar in the West. We call it anonymous. And that's one of the groups that we talk about having here. And you've seen that they've been active uh, out there and been attacking websites, uh, communications, and, and other capabilities on a very small scale right now. Uh, and again, they're not working at the behest of the United States government. Uh, they are not working uh, within a structure of information warfare operations. Yet, uh, you know, how much we are going to uh, sit back, watch this happen, or try to control that? Yet again, it's going to be interesting as things unfold. Yeah, we're talking to John McCumber. He's an old cybersecurity guy, uh, former military officer. We're going to continue to talk to him. I've got a theory on some of that. I'm going to run it by John, see what he thinks. We're going to talk more about Ukraine, Russia, cybersecurity, some of the freak out in the headlines and on social media. He's going to help us turn down the noise on that. More with John McCumber on Herd Tell right after that. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell, talking to my good friend, John McCumber. I appreciate his time greatly. All right, I got a theory for you. Right. We are seeing diplomatically something really interesting happen with Russia. People who have been Putin allies, Putin supporters, all of a sudden they're not backing him on this invasion. Uh, even places like Kazakhstan, which has practically almost become a satellite state again, they even backed off of him. Uh, now Levinchenko in Belarus is starting to wobble a little bit because he just figured out that if Putin goes down, he's got nothing. Um, is it possible that we overblew the Russians' uh, propaganda and cybersecurity ability because they were relying on these third-party wink-wink, nudge-nudge people that they didn't really control? And some of those folks just aren't going to independently help them out here, and it's just exposing that their network was really more other people that they were using by proxy than they themselves having expertise. 
you know, this is a great point. And, and you bring up exactly what one of the major problems are in this environment. Yeah, the good news is you have these third party operators that you can claim, you know, plausible deniability you can separate yourself from. They're not under government tr- control. That's the good news. Guess what the bad news is? They're not under government control and they give you plausible deniability. Uh, the challenge that the Russians have with this, again, goes back to those opening remarks that I made. These third party groups consist of Russians. Guess who's also in those third party groups? Ukrainians, Chechens, uh, you know, you, uh, Estonians. You know, you've got people across uh, Eastern Europe and across uh, you know, very uh, Western Asia that are that are involved with these groups that may not share Putin's uh, aggressive uh, stance toward Ukraine. And you got to really uh, understand that these groups are not to be synonymous with Russian policy or uh, Russian aggression. Yeah, and we probably shouldn't assume that they're friends of ours just because they're enemies of Russia right this second. Uh, yeah. let's, go, let's go through a few things that have been floating around online because people have kind of been freaking out uh, do you think there's any way that Russia uh, retaliates on America and or the wider rest with cybersecurity attacks? This is something that's been talked about a lot. Uh, it's been mentioned, especially as a proportional response to sanctions, that they would try cyber warfare. I'm just kind of wondering, like, if they can't even get it right against the Ukrainians, they're a little busy right now. Are they really going to be able to focus on something against the states or against Europe or whoever the case may be? Do you think obviously it's a valid concern because it could happen? But is it something that we should really be worried about right this second? We've had experience over the last decade uh, since not Petya and other kinds of attacks that were done against infrastructure resources to be able to examine our uh, critical infrastructure. And if you go to the DH web, DHS website, read about those 16 critical infrastructures, you know, communications, uh, you know, water, electricity, you, you go and, and look at those. We've had a decade to look at those vulnerabilities in there and come up with plans in order to be able to defend against these types of international attacks. So I'm not saying we're perfect at that or we've got it all figured out because I don't think that's the case. What you do see, though, is that you see that the Russians, uh, again, they either are, are holding their cards to their chest, at which maybe, again, that's that's a level of chess that uh, that maybe we're giving Putin too much credit for. Uh, but it is possible that they're just uh, holding their fire with their capabilities. Some of the things that we talk about are called burning zero days. So you have some really uh, a critical vulnerability that can impact a broad section of infrastructure, whether that's the internet, whether that's gas distribution, electricity, whatever. And once you put that out in public, you, you know, once you once you pull the trigger on that weapon, uh, that's out there now. Not saying it, it could be very effective, but you get don't get to use that again. So what we're seeing here is either Putin and and his uh, leadership is is very very clever, or they simply just don't uh, and didn't perceive that they needed to be able to deploy these uh, unique capabilities at this time. I don't know the answer to that. Um, One theory I was reading a little bit about was um, they were talking about they have the ability to do a lot of damage to infrastructures. Uh, I'm talking about the cybersecurity infrastructures, computer grids, things like this. But one of the other problems with that is, is they said uh, the state actors would be very low to do that because once you do that, you've also killed all your intelligence gathering capability at the same time. And when they rebuild the new intelligence capability that you just destroyed, now you're starting from zero trying to gather intelligence because this is a multi-layered thing. Talk about that nuance because these things don't happen in a vacuum. We write about them in, you know, the Washington Post or wherever in a vacuum, but that's not how this works in the real life because information cybersecurity stuff that's two-way flow in a lot of these cases even if they can take it down is there instances like that where they don't want to take it down because now you just lost an asset for yourself as well absolutely i mean these you can go back in history uh and and that's why i i just love being a student of history and you go back and see these same concerns being addressed for many, you know, for, for millennia, you know, the, the information warfare and the use of these tools is nothing new. Uh, we watched uh, Churchill watch uh, his fellow Britons die, uh, that he could have prevented the death, knowing that if he prevented uh, 
these attacks and everything else, we were telling the Nazis exactly what we knew about their communications and telecommunication systems. And, and he had to make that call. He had to sit there and watch men and women uh, of his country, fellow countrymen, die in an attack that he could have prevented because he didn't want to disclose what their capabilities were at that time. And that's what, you know, again, are we seeing that here? I'm not sure. Uh, I really don't know. Uh, I don't know what's going on with uh, Putin and the leadership in this regard, but it is something to consider. As, as I said earlier, once you play that card, you can't bring it back. You know, it's always going to be something that, uh, that's on the table now and people are going to quickly develop their defenses. One people, one thing people kept bringing up though was, they want to bring up something like the colonial pipeline thing, the malware stuff. It, that seems to me almost to be unrelated. Although I know maybe there was some Russian influence behind it because of those disparate groups we call it. But to me, those seem like two. Those that doesn't really seem to be related with what we're dealing with here in Ukraine, though, is it? Because it's a different structural way that they go about their business with this cybersecurity stuff, isn't it? Well, one of the things that I found real helpful over the years that I would uh, did this work for the Pentagon, and I would map these out for our leadership at, at, in the U.S., when we talk about these various threats and, and, and assets that could be attacked, when you talk about a threat, you have to break down the threat into four components, agent, intent, target, and mechanism. So what happens is there's a variety of mechanisms that can be used. These are also referred to as vulnerabilities in these various systems. But to, in order to be effective, effectively understand who's going to use them and for what purpose, because again, can you use a vulnerability that are used for, say, a ransomware attack? Uh, can you use that for an information warfare attack on a nation state? Sure you can. Uh, but you have to understand the agent who's, who's initiating that uh, attack, intent, what are they trying to do, what's the target of, of using this, and what mechanism are they going to use. That's going to help you more effectively understand how these uh, kind of situations evolve and how they deploy uh, attacks against various vulnerabilities. And these vulnerabilities we've seen, like you say, we, we talk about how they've, uh, we've seen these vulnerabilities and, and how they uh, are, have been used in the past against commercial operators, how they're used for ransomware against medical facilities. Can I use those for nation state warfare? On that line of thought, though, I'm wondering, you used to teach this stuff. Let's say you're doing a lecture at uh, George Washington or somewhere on what's happening in Ukraine and Russia in hindsight. Is it going to become a doctrine for states and militaries now? Like we've said, you know, you, you never attack with infantry until you add air cover, right? Which the Russians have screwed that up too, but that's another matter for another day. Is it just going to be after what we've seen in Ukraine now, doctrine of you cannot have a land warfare if you do not have cyber control of the cyber realm now? Because we are watching the Ukrainians in real time affect a military campaign where they are grossly outnumbered just by staying online. That's pretty yeah. remarkable change in, in how warfare is conducted, isn't it? I think it's it, it's incredible. And again, it goes back to something I keep saying about this environment. It it it's it's just amazing what's not happening. I mean, you know, it, it, many civil war battles were preceded by them cutting, you know, uh, crawling up telephone poles or telegraph poles and cutting the telegraph wires. Uh, and, and being able to shut down communications at, at Little Big Top during the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, they cleared off the top of a mountain so they can run up signal flags on top of the mountain to communicate privately among, uh, among the Union needs forces that were there at the time. So you, these, these situations are, are analogous to what's happened throughout history. So saying cyberspace is some kind of a new or special or sexy and exciting environment is, is really just an extension of what's gone on in warfare for millennia. So understanding how we handle the communications, how we understand how we allow or not allow our, our, uh, our enemies to be able to use their infrastructure and environment. What I say, what's astounding what's happening in Ukraine is what's not happening. Yeah, talking to John McCumber. Uh, let's go back to where we started with the old Cold War. I My concern is no matter what happens because of what Putin has done here, whatever comes next is going to be unstable and not good. Uh, even if the Ukrainians hold them off, that, that destabilizes Russia, that destabilizes probably Belarus, a lot of other places. 
use your Cold War experience for a minute and and talk about these things. How should we as Americans prepare for what comes next in this? We're not going to, unless something escalates, we won't be committing troops, but clearly things have changed and we need to make a plan going forward. What would you recommend? There's a long list. And, you know, in fact, somebody on, uh, you know, you and I have a, a common Twitter environment, social media, and somebody asked me, well, what do you think the president should be doing right now uh, in this environment, you know, rather than, you know, watching and doing whatever they're doing right now? And I looked at this destabilization, some of the challenges here, and, and the first thing that, that I would do is start working on energy independence for the United States first, and then supporting Europe in that regard, as, as well as near, uh, you know, near Eastern countries over there. Uh, Russia has a big energy, uh, it's a big energy producer, and they distribute all over Europe. So what you're seeing is a response from NATO and others is a recognition of the fact that they're relying on Russia for a lot of their energy, uh, oil and gas production and distribution. Uh, so one of the things that we need to do as a country is to make sure we're energy independent. What do we need to do that? Well, we need to do things like make sure we have pipelines. We need to make sure uh, that we have um, harvesting natural gas uh, from our own resources as best we can. We're able to manage those. Uh, we're able to rebuild our nuclear program, start building nuclear plants. You know, look what's happened in Germany. They cancel their nuclear program. And I guess they're going to try to run things with windmills and, and you know, and uh and solar panels, but of course, a lot of a lot of Germany is in a northern climate. They don't have uh, really. It's not like Southern California where they can generate wind and, and solar power to the degree they need. Uh, and yet, so they've got a stale uh, nuclear program. So talking about energy independent, we have to talk about nuclear. We have to talk about energy production here in the United States as well, and energy independence. That's going to change the the calculus in dealing with a renewed Russia aggression and dealing with them as they work within that. And, and I know it sounds kind of, you know, displaced. It sounds like something far away, but by God, that's going to make a big difference in how we can deal with an, a, uh, uh, an empowered or aggressive Russia. Yeah. John McCumber, great stuff. The overall theme here though, is these are new spins on very, very old human issues. And uh, I always appreciate your insight and your wisdom, my friend. Let folks know where you're at on social media. You've kind of semi-stepped back, but now you're getting settled in. You're dipping your toe back in, and we appreciate your opinions. Let folks know where they can find all those great food takes you put out since you are a founding member of Twitter Supper Club in good standing, my friend. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny. I got to tell you a quick story about that. So uh, I had a chance to meet one of our mutual Twitter friends here at the Supper Club, and uh, and and this brilliant and highly accomplished woman and her husband came to my house where I had a chance to finally show my cooking skills. And it, it was an absolute and utter disaster. So, uh, we, <laughs> so, but I tell you what, I, I'm at uh, John McCumber at John McCumber is just my name uh, on Twitter, uh, where I live. I certainly get the privilege of writing for uh, Ordinary Times. I got another one coming out on phase two of this life decision I made. So I'm just sharing with other people how I'm uh, kind of struggling along at this phase of my career. And then uh, have an opportunity to uh, talk with you on occasion and have a privilege of being on Hurtel. Yep. And uh, a lot of people writing about the great resignation. John supercharged his and took off. Uh, so we can talk more about that in the future. John yeah. McCumber, uh, we'll get you back in the rotation now that you're settled in, my friend. Always good talking to you and we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Andrew. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, sir. This is the story of the one. As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24-7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.